<laughs> Thank you, everybody, for your patience. As Gail said, uh, we started this book to, uh, in order to trace Grand River, not only its history, but to show everybody what's there, what was there, and what you can expect to find if you take a road trip down it through the state of Michigan. And she explained to you that we found this photograph that we thought uh, kind of exemplified the, uh, the transmogrification of the road from the early days of the carriage to, to the uh, motor car. And next to it is a uh, Rand McNally map of Michigan from 1925. I don't know if you can see it very well, but there's a Native American who's carving a petroglyph uh, <laughs> on a rock and then he sees a Model T coming in. We like to call that, there goes the neighborhood. <laughs> but as uh, Gail explained, Grand River as the road and the trail goes from Detroit, the Straits of Detroit, all the way to Lake Michigan. At one time it went to Grand Haven and that's the picture you see at the top. And it emptied into Lake Michigan, as the, as the river emptied into Lake Michigan, I should say, not the road. The road would end there also where the, uh, the, sea sh uh, the uh, lake shore was. You'll see various places along here where the Grand River actually crosses Grand River. The river itself crosses. There are several towns where that happens. Now, as you all know, the Grand River itself does not cross Grand River Avenue until Lansing. So this was the way the Native Americans would proceed up to the river uh, from Detroit. And that's a good distance of about 85 miles. And you see here in this picture, you see the Native Americans. This was a, a series of photos or postcards taken about 1905. And by that time, the, the last vestiges of the Algonquian people were trying to make a living by selling postcards of themselves with their their native uh, homes and their native costumes uh, to people who happen to be traveling down the road because that was, a, that was a source of income for them. One of the ways we were able to do this book, our format for Arcadia books, if you've ever seen them, were basically all pictures with captions. We were lucky enough to meet somebody who actually had the largest collection of photos of Michigan in the state of Michigan. And what would happen would be itinerant photographers would come through town on their horse and buggy take a picture of the town because people didn't own cameras, they were too expensive. He would take a picture of the town, then he would sell it as a postcard to the town. So while a lot of these towns don't exist anymore, these photos do. Luckily enough, this man whose name was Dave Tinder, who actually lived in Livonia for a while, he donated them all to the University of Michigan Clements Library and they're digitizing <coughs> all of them. So you'll actually be able to access these incredible pictures of Michigan online. Another uh, interesting uh, thing that happened uh, in, the, in the development of Grand River and some of the other roads coming out of Detroit was the uh, introduction of macadamization, uh, corduroy roads, uh, and also eventually paving. And you can see they're paving the road up there in Portland, Michigan. How many of you have ever been to Portland, Michigan? It's, a, it's an interesting town where Grand River crosses the Grand River. Uh, and also there was the introduction of a mode of transportation long gone now, which were the interurban railroads. And there were a network of interurban railroads from Detroit into Livonia, New, uh, into Newburgh, into to Northville and Plymouth and Wayne. There was also a network of interurban railways that went from uh, Muskegon Heights uh, into, uh, um, into uh, Grand Rapids and into Grand Haven. And this is actually a map of the Grand Rapids, Grand Haven, and Muskegon Railway. And uh, you can see all the stops here. It's kind of hard to go from one to the other, but you can see all the stops. It went from Muskegon into Grand Rapids and all the uh, stops in between. And uh, on that side of the state, there are a lot of uh, the old train stations still extant. And you can see them, and if you go to Coopersville, you can see some of the trains, in fact, and that's a, a big part of their museum. But we're going to start out in Detroit. This was a little background about Grand River. Now we're going to start out with the beautiful Albert Kahn built Detroit Athletic Club, still going strong down in downtown Detroit. For a while, it was in danger of closing, 
but it has become very fashionable again, and now there's a waiting list to join. It even has a bowling alley inside, and you can stay. And there's uh, rooms as well. So that's where we're starting. This is where Grand River starts, the Detroit Athletic Club. And I learned something very interesting about it. You hear about Albert Kahn, very famous architect. But his brother, whose name was Julius Kahn, who you never hear about, invented something probably even more important than Albert Kahn. He invented reinforced concrete. And, and that's how they were able to build all these skyscrapers because Julius Kahn invented, I think that's pretty important. You never hear about the other brother who did something even bigger. Absolutely. You were probably <laughs> thinking we were going to say the orange Julius, but no. <laughs> you did not. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a site that I love to start out with because many of us have memories of this. Obviously growing up anywhere near Detroit is J.L. Hudson. Now J.L. Hudson didn't start out on Grand River. It actually was built in the 1800, late 1800s, but moved to Grand River in 1911. Um, and it was the, at one time the tallest department store in the world. There were 14 stories. Many of you probably could name them. Remember they had elevator operators, those white gloved elevator operators that would take you up to the notions department or, or the wonderful uh, restaurant that was up there. And at one time, they also had the largest, you can see here, it was the largest American flag in the world, 90 feet by 230 feet, weighed 900 pounds. They would display that all the time on, on holidays, like Memorial Day. And of course, they started the parade. And uh, as we know, Hudson's eventually got demolished, sadly, but many of us have memories. Do any of you remember the wonderful windows they used to have at Christmas with the animated displays. You used to go down and see Santa. So many great memories of Hudson's. You'll see, it's hard to see these pictures, but we've got the flag, we've got Santa, and just the hustle and bustle right in front of Hudson's downtown. You might want to mention that the building that used to be at Woodward and Grand River was the Newcomb Endicott Company, and once they tore that down, the Hudson's building extended to Grand River. And, uh, and if you went caddy corner to that or, or diagonally, you would be a, at the uh, site of the first Kresge uh, store as well. Now, many of you may well know that the, the state of Michigan's first capital was in Detroit and it was in Capitol Park, which is at the corner of Griswold and Grand River. And what you'll see there today is this statue of Stevens T. Mason. In fact, you'd see it in broad daylight right now if you were there, rather than total darkness, which is here. <laughs> but Stevens T. Mason was considered the boy governor. Obviously, he was very young when he took office. He's about 24 years old. Uh, and the state capitol is shown in the middle there. And over the years, that building remained, and it was resurfaced, and eventually became the Capitol Union School and was eventually named Central High School. Did any of you go to Central High? My mother went there, no? Yeah. Okay, obviously when the building burned down in the 1890s, it was relocated to the old Union Hall, which is part of Wayne State now. This area here is very fashionable now in Detroit. I don't know if any of you have been down there, but I was just there two days ago, and it's incredible. Hotels, shops, lots of people are living down there. This is a really, up uh, area that is really restaurants. It's a great area of Detroit right now. Another interesting site that's at the old uh, site of Capitol Park was the Al uh, Seymour Finney Barn. There's a little plaque, historical plaque. And that's all you'll see today. The Seymour Finney Barn is long gone. But Seymour Finney was an active abolitionist and he owned the Finney Hotel on Woodward Avenue at Gratiot. Then over in Capitol Park near Grand River, he had the livery stable for people who were staying in his hotel. Now, as many of you may know, that during the time uh, prior to the Civil War, because of the Fugitive Slave Act, we were getting people along here in the Underground Railway escaping from slavery, but we also had bounty hunters looking for fugitive slaves. So it's a, it's a bit of irony and a little humor to note that people who were staying at Seymour Finney's hotel looking for fugitive slaves had no idea that Seymour Finney was harboring them in his livery stable out back. So they never actually uh, crossed paths. L luckily. Luckily. Some of the innovations that were introduced by modern roadways at the turn of the century, because being Detroit was the automobile capital of the world, 
uh, if you could see this better, you would see that in the earlier part of the years, uh, there would be a traffic cop out there, and he would have a sign that he would turn that would say, stop, stop and go. How's that for a job, standing there doing stop and go all day? I don't even know if carpal tunnel was invented back then, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure that guy would have had it. And then uh, towards the 20s, you have these very interesting little obelisks and islands uh, with, uh, they almost look like lighthouses that would signal you to move forward uh, just before the traffic light became kind of uh, standard. And then you see the, uh, at the bottom, you see Grand River Avenue when it's just been paved in 1929 and a little stretch of highway there with a lot of Model A's running down it in, uh, near Redford, Michigan. I can do that. Absolutely. And here I'll start talking about what I was talking about before, the GAR Hall. And as I said, it was designed in 1897. It's now owned by a film production company called Minefield. And they also own the restaurants downstairs. There's their logo. And here's the building in around 1905. You can see what it looks like. And so many of us have driven by there for years wondering what's this mysterious castle-like building. Up in the very top in the turret room, they now rent that out. And their headquarters are in the old ballroom for the Civil War veterans, this huge hall <laughs> that used to have all the dinners for them. So um, here. Uh, so again, it's really hard to see. But here we are during construction. The, there was holes in the roof. And again, it's hard to see. There's pictures in the book, obviously. But it's beautifully renovated and with these incredible windows. And the hall itself can be rented out for parties for up to 150 people. It's a really unusual and beautiful space to hold any kind of event, especially up in the turret room. It's really magical. It's holding your events in a castle. So I highly recommend it. You can sort of see to the lower right, that's the headquarters of the people who run the place now. And they've actually restored the murals that depict battles of the Civil War. Yeah that were there at the time when the Grand Army of the Republic was in session. They even dug up old bottles and things, and they have on display a little Civil War museum of some of the artifacts from them. And here's the picture that was on the cover, and we show that here so that you get a little perspective of where we are. And, and of course, you can see the Carl's Top sign. House behind the carriage, mm -hmm. Wonder Bread, and if you go to the next slide, you'll see that right now, if you were there where that picture was taken, the Detroit um, Motor, City. Motor City Casino would be right where those, uh, right behind there. Now, a few other things that uh, we'd like to point out to people who grew up around Grand River, uh, a lot of innovations. Uh, Grand River at Warren was a, a very big stop for the streetcars in the 40s. Uh, over in Oakman Boulevard, there used to be the Beverly Theater. I don't know, how, did any of you grow up around Detroit and Grand River in that area? Did you, you go did. to the Beverly Theater? Yes. I, we heard a lot of good, pardon? I saw the Ten Commandments there when it first came up. Wow, that's great, that's great to know. We always ask people because it was a very popular theater. And, um, oh, Sears was across the street, okay. Absolutely. I think this is a church now, by the way, the river, uh, where the Beverly is. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, okay. And then we have the streetcars down there. Now, of course, Detroit was severely damaged. Parts of Grand River severely damaged in the riots of 1967. This is a, a historic photo that shows uh, a section of Grand River in, in kind of a, a state of rubble, and there's a tank moving through there. Uh, and uh, as Gail described earlier, we're seeing a great deal of recovery finally along this corridor. Uh, so as you go down there, you'll see a lot of new construction. Now, I like to point out some of the things along the way that maybe you've driven by and never stopped to notice. One of our favorite little secrets is this place called the African Bead Gallery and Museum. It's hard to see him, but the man, his name is Olayami Dabbles. He started doing artist therapy and this is an incredible place. You drive by and the walls are brightly painted. But inside, he has this wonderful museum that talks about the history of beads throughout Africa and the world. They were used as currency. Um, there's objects of worship in there. And they also you know, sell some jewelry as well. But it's a wonderful and historic place. If you go there, it always looks closed. And he gives you a phone number to call so you can get inside. But it's well worth the trip. And he's a fascinating guy. 
who knows so much about art. He even got one of those Kresge Fellowships of Ald's History of Art. And that, by the way, is just south of West Grand Boulevard on Grand River. Now, if you did grow up near Grand River, it's a safe bet that you attended one of these three Anybody schools. Anybody attend one of these three schools? Which did you, sir? Cast All Tech. Right. The new, there's a new Cast Tech, obviously. Gail's mother went to Central. My mother went to Northwestern. So we've got it covered here in the room. <laughs> <laughs> And all those schools are still running, okay? They may not look exactly the same anymore. Well, Cast Tech is new. That's right. And some familiar sites you would have seen along Grand River in Detroit in those days, the Grandy Ballroom. How many of you have actually been to the Grandy? Very famous, obviously, Janis Joplin, The Who, all kinds of very famous people went there. It was actually just a uh, big band ballroom in the 20s. But uh, obviously it was a very famous place. And many of us grew up going to hockey games at the Big Red Burn, as it was called, Olympia. Also the site of a lot of different uh, rock concerts as well, but obviously where the Red Wings played. And one of the places we feel so sad about being demolished. Now, did anybody ever go to the Riviera Theater? This guy is good. Yeah, what did you see right. there? It's a song of the South there, and then they re-released uh, re the silent version of uh, Noah's Ark. Oh, wow. So this was a very important place. It, was, it cost a million dollars to build in 1925. Then, unfortunately, the Depression came. But uh, it, it, they, they expanded it before the Depression. It was 4,800 seats, which is tremendous. And then, obviously, it fell into disrepair. Even though it was, this is interesting, because even if you can put something on the historic register of places, they can still tear it down, because they tore it down in 1996. We feel now with all the incredible renovations going on in Detroit, this theater could have been saved. We've, we've seen other theaters, for example, the Senate Theater restored. They're restoring the Algier Theater, that's being restored. Obviously the Redford is still going strong. And this should have been restored, but back then they tore it down. Now, interestingly enough, there's a Riviera Theater at, um, it's like Nine Mile and Middle Belt. It's the new Riviera the, the Cinema. It's what used to be called the West River Shopping Center, the West River Theater. It's a, a relatively new theater, but you can see to the right, it's hard to see. They actually mimic the old sign of the Riviera to sort of pay homage to the old theater. The old bleed sign. So yes. Grand River, just west of Middle Belt near Nine Mile. It's a really good theater and they have those comfy seats that you can um, go to sleep on as you lay, lay back and eat your popcorn. Another thing, and it's kind of hard to see here, but Gary Grimshaw was one of the great artists. There were two great artists that did posters for the Grandy Ballroom, and those are all collector's items now. It but says Big Brother and the Holding Company, the MC5, and these are very valuable because they were meant to just be thrown away and torn down. So the people that have them, you can see them for sale on eBay. They're beautiful. Yeah. Now, I don't know how many know this, and we learned this pretty much by doing the book, but the city of Redford got its name by, of all things, being where the Indians would ford the Red River. The Rouge, of course, is French for red, and the Native Americans forded the river right between, uh, actually just past Lasser, right between Old Redford and what is now the city of Redford, and this is actually a picture of where they would ford that river, and that is one of those interesting stories that uh, is true. This is where they would ford the Red River, and that's how it became Red Ford. We highly encourage people to join the Friends of the Rouge. They're, they they clean out the river every year, and they have these wonderful tours, and they're really doing a great job keeping the Rouge River going. Now, this is uh, one of my favorite parts of the thing, although you can't see the sign, darn it. Um, I love the fact that I grew up saying Lasher. How many people grew up saying Lasher? Anybody? Oh, thank you. <laughs> we were a Lasher family. There's Lasser and Lasher. And for some reason, people say both. But it was named after a Charles Lasser. And you see his general store here. And they named the road after him, obviously. It's no longer there, but that's taken around 1905. And here's the corner around 1940. But what you can't see up there is uh, at the corner, I took this picture a couple months ago at the corner of Civic Center and Northwestern and it's construction and it was spelled L-A-S-H-E-R. <laughs> so even though it's technically spelled Lasser, it said Lasher and it proved me right on present. On and at that corner now, uh, you would see the Redford Theater. Which is technically not on Grand River, it's Grand River adjacent. 
but we think it's such a terrific place. We always encourage people to go there. They always get like movie stars from the past. Every year they do It's a Wonderful Life and they have the girl that played Zuzu. She's pretty old, but they still get her. I went there to see the birds and they had Tippi Hedren a few years ago. So, and they have the Organ Society. The Detroit Theater Organ Society is the lifeblood. It's an all volunteer group and they keep the Redford Theater open. It's a fabulous place to go. Now in the early years of Grand River, after it was a obviously a Native American trail, it became one of the major routes into the interior of the Michigan Territory. And as time went on, it became a stagecoach route, and it also became a plank road. And this was done pretty much after 1850 because of the Plank Road Act of 1850. Now, does anybody know what a plank road, does everybody know what a plank road is? I guess you could pretty much guess. Yeah, basically, it, it, it came after corduroy roads where they would just fell trees. They would actually plane the planks and... Uh, a huge improvement, believe it or not. Yes, absolutely. From dirt. And the idea was because the capital had been moved from Detroit to Lansing, still along Grand River, uh, you would be able to take a stagecoach from Detroit into Lansing along this plank road. Now, it was a toll road just to, to actually guarantee the upkeep. And this photo on the top left is an actual photo of an old uh, toll house that stood near Inkster along Grand River. And this photo was taken in the turn of the century. There's a family using it as a front porch, but at one time that would have been where the toll collector would stand. Not where toll house cookies were invented, though. No, no. No, this predates toll house cookies as far as we know. But, but what we think is fascinating, look down here at the bottom thing, just like when you go on the turnpike anywhere and you get that ticket and then you pay, this is the original, how they looked. They'd punch your ticket depending on what you were riding, how many axles you had, and where you were going. You'd pay because somebody had to pay for these new plank roads. And just like today, it depends on what you're traveling along with. If it's cattle, if it's a carriage, there were different prices for that. Yeah, it's hard to tell on here, but yeah. yeah. It's in, again, it's in the book. Now, these are some sites, uh, it's kind of hard to see, but these are some sites that you would have seen uh, as you went into Redford, as we know it today, uh, at the time. You can see uh, Emil Huck's Inn. You can Bet see... Bet and Jesse's Fish and Chips were pretty famous. We've got the Hefty's Coney Island. So there's a few uh, restaurants and other places that are still there in a place called Five Points, which was very popular during Prohibition because you could get illicit liquor there. What you would have found in the 1830s and on was the 16 Mile House on Indian Trail, which was later uh, transformed by Milton Botsford into the Botsford Inn. And that's still there. Eventually it was purchased by Henry Ford in 1924 because he used to take Clara there when they were courting. Upstairs, he put in actual, he was very into square dancing, and you'll find a lot of Henry Ford properties uh, used to have um, uh, spring floors. It, the floors would have springs in them for square dancing because he loved it so much. Now, obviously, the Botsford Inn, we, we did a presentation where a woman went to her prom at the Botsford Inn. So that was used for a lot of different things, and it was bought by Beaumont Hospital. It was the Botsford Hospital. Now it's owned by Beaumont. But they've kept it pretty much intact, which is really nice. They use it for offices. But it was a very big stagecoach stop along the way. Now, we like to call this three trails, no waiting. Because when you get into Farmington, you get a very real picture of the fact that a lot of the major roads going from Detroit into the interior were Indian trails or Native American trails. And three trails cross right in downtown Farmington. One is the Shiawassee Trail which actually runs along what is now Grand River, and it trails off to a point where we can't really identify where it went, though we do know the Shiawassee Trail ended up in Saginaw. Two other trails, of course, the Grand River Trail, which was just south of where Grand River is today, crossed there, and also the Orchard Lake Trail. And Orchard Lake was a very sacred place to the Algonquians, and they would traverse up there and they would go and use as a burial ground and a sacred spot the Apple Island, which used to be called... Um, Not a Sagorshni. Yeah, let's call it Apple Island. <laughs> <laughs> and it's said that Chief Pontiac is buried there. Now, a very sad story, and this is, this is kind of a part of the American fabric. 
we had these wonderful interurban railways that ran from Detroit. They would run into Redford, they run into Farmington, into Newburgh, Plymouth, Lane, Nankin, uh, and they were just fantastic. You could go to work, you could go from Birmingham into Detroit. They were very inexpensive. They were a wonderful public transportation network that started in the 1890s, and they went into the 1920s. And who do you suppose destroyed that? <laughs> That's right. Well, not just Ford Motor, all the automobile companies, they didn't like that. They didn't like that idea of They wanted of everyone to have a car. So what they did is they pulled a little trick <laughs> on the inner urbans, on the Detroit Urban Railway. They got, a, they got through lobbying, they got a law passed that said the right of way belongs <laughs> to the automobile and the tracks that belong to the Detroit Urban Railway had to be moved to the side. And they did this on purpose because they knew that because the Detroit Urban Railway ran on a very small profit margin, that it would bankrupt them, and it did. And they destroyed that, and it, it of course, made it impossible to use this wonderful network of railroads. And you can see at one time it was a very, a very going concern. The Detroit Urban Railroad had a stock. There was an actual rare song here called the D.U.R. Blues. You can see it here, if you could see it a little better, as you can see There's the tracks track going there. through uh, Redford, right. Now there are some remnants of the Detroit Urban Railroad and the Detroit United Lines. In Farmington, right at the foot of Orchard Lake Road, you can still see the old powerhouse, which I think is a winery now. And across the street, you would have seen the car uh, barn, but that is actually a plaza now with, with businesses. But here are a few remnants there, and at the bottom right, there's actually a photo of the train coming, the urban train. On the left there. Yeah, uh, with a, a horse and carriage next to it and an old Model T next to that. And we like to say that uh, only one of those runs on oats. There's a lot of history in, uh, if you go to Farmington, they have a lot of historic plaques that are along Grand River. You can go to the Governor Warner Mansion. He was the governor, uh, Fred Baltimore Warner, Governor from 1905 to 1911, some pictures of his family as well. There's a beautiful mansion there that you can take tours of. And a couple of other places we like in Farmington, the Civic Theater, which is owned by the city of Farmington and very reasonable and shows first-run movies. And here we have the Walker Wixom Inn. Which is not extant, by the way. It's actually where Sellers Buick is today. <laughs> and, and there's a model of that. There's a wonderful model of it here made by a... a a fellow who helped us a great deal, Brian Golden, who's an expert, by the way, on the urban railroad. But uh, you can see by 1905, this picture on the left, the, uh, the remains of the Walker Wixom Inn uh, were, were pretty uh, destitute. Uh, but there are several inns that are still standing along Grand River where the carriage would stop for the night. Now, another thing we love to tell people, we love to solve the mystery of Novite. Everybody thinks, and I'm sure you do too, that it's Novi stands for what? Number six, right? That it was the sixth stop on the stagecoach stop. We've done extensive research on this, and you can quote us. <laughs> it actually came from an early settler's wife that was in Novi. She liked the expression Novi Sad, which means new gardens. It's a Serbian word, Novi Sad, and they decided to call it Novi or Novi, and that's really where Novi came from. Now, it's a very heated debate, but we're sticking to this story. And, and Brian Golden likes to inform us uh, and everybody that in 1832, there were no stage routes, there were no railroads, uh -huh. there was the no way Dickens. it could be the number six of anything. And it's hard, you can see there's a Camelback Bridge there. At one time, they used to employ prison labor, and this bridge, which is still there, it looks really old. You can still see that there on Novi. Um, and two men died during construction, so they stopped using state labor, to, obviously, to build it. Now, another stagecoach stop that we love to tell people about, if you have a motorcycle, maybe you've been to the New Hudson Inn, right at the corner of, it's where Grand a bunch River. comes together, Grand River and essentially Milford Road in New Hudson. It was built in 1831. Here's how it looks now, very, very similar. And it's a great little uh, stop along the way, and it, a lot of motorcycles go there, if any of you have ever been there but it's a great little bar that's still running to this day along Grand River. How many of you have been to Island Lake? Which is now, a yeah, it's a, it's a metro park, obviously. Many people don't realize that that was the training ground for the American troops going into the war uh, during the Spanish-American War. 
There's a picture here at the top on the left of, uh, of actually a reunion of, uh, of soldiers that trained at Island Lake. By the turn of the century, it was a very popular resort in the summer. And you it can was see uh, there's a picture there of women really overdressed with long dresses. And this was, you know, they'd go out on a very hot day. We feel sorry for them. That was their, <laughs> that was their bathing costumes. By the 1920s, it was the home of a popular casino uh, ballroom called the Island Lake Casino and the Blue Lantern uh, Ballroom. Uh, actually, at the top here is a postcard that came out uh, in the mail to folks in 1929 telling everyone that the McKinney's Cotton Pickers were going to be playing there. They were a very popular Detroit band that recorded exclusively for Victor. And now we're out in Brighton, which is near where I live. One of the first places we did a book signing was one of our favorite places. If you like hardware stores, Rollison's Hardware, which is technically on Main Street at Grand River, was built in 1924. It looks and smells like a hardware store should be. It's got wooden floors. It's got a guy there that if you need a spring for a screen door that was made in 1963, he has it somewhere upstairs. <laughs> it's, it's the opposite of Home Depot. It's real old fashioned service. And we ended up doing our first book signing there because we like it so much. It's really worth the trip to Brighton if you like hardware stores, Rollison Hardware. And uh, a couple other places, it's uh, hard to see. There's Champ's Pub, which was an old blacksmith shop that looks just like that. That's a bar. And that was the old Mellis Hospital. We've met some people that were born there uh, that is now converted into a real estate office. A couple other places, we, um, when I was little, we used to go to the Lakes Drive-In. There's not many drive-ins anymore, but there was a great neon sign. There's an ad from when it opened. Um, it opened in the 50s and gave out corsages to the ladies, orchids. And uh, here we're getting into Howell, which is uh, an old bowling alley that's still there called the Bolodrome. And that sign is still there. You'll, one of the great things about Grand River and, and Roadside America is it's very much uh, possible to see some wonderful uh, old uh, signs of, <laughs> of the not so distant past. So if you're taking Grand River, here's another couple stops that I love to tell people about. Again, very few people know about this. There's an outdoor sculpture park that also has poetry. It's free to the public. It's called the um, Oaken Transformation Sculpture Park. And it, you get to it, so you walk through a dentist's office. He sponsors it, Dr. Bonine, B-O-N-I-N-E. And it's open during the week. Anybody can go there and it's free. It's this beautiful outdoor sculpture park through the woods. It's, it's beautiful and very few people, like I said, know about it. And then over there is Thompson's Art Glass, which was started in the 20s on Grand River in Detroit and then moved way west out to Howell. And it still does stained glass and art glass, but it stayed on Grand River for over 100 years. Here's a picture from Dave Tinder's collection we really had to include. There's a gentleman standing next to a sign in downtown Howell about 1922, and it has an arrow and uh, mile markers for all of the major stops along Grand River from Detroit to Muskegon. And uh, Howell was kind of a halfway point in a lot of ways from that. You can see the courthouse is still standing. That's another great building to visit. It was a Romanesque building built in 1899. At one time, they really were hoping that Howell was going to be the state capital, and it's still a functioning courthouse uh, in, right in downtown Howell. Here's an old picture of, again, you can't see, but it's... You can't uh, see the opera house, but it is there. There was an opera house that was built in the 1800s. It had everybody from William Jennings Bryan to famous opera stars. It closed in the 20s, but they're renovating that in, in downtown Howell, and it's a beautiful space. Also, they have uh, the Howell Carnegie Library. Um, there's a lot of Carnegie Libraries throughout Michigan. There's actually an Arcadia book just on Carnegie Libraries. Uh, Andrew Carnegie donated library, money for libraries throughout the country. This is one of the nicer ones with the stone exterior. And here's a couple of men that helped us with a lot of the pictures in the book. Now, uh, here's the Howell Theater that was built in the 1920s. And a kid, literally a kid to the right there in his 20s, bought the theater a few years ago and restored it, and it's showing first-run movies in downtown Howell. So there's a lot of old movie theaters along Grand River. Oh, here's a better picture it. of the Opera House. And here's the so Opera So that house. is really being restored. It's a huge building, and it's a really interesting building. Now, Fowlerville is famous for two things, and two things especially. One is it's the home birthplace of Charlie Geringer, one of the Hall of Fame Tigers, and also the home of the Fowlerville Fair. Any 
It's also the home of one of the greatest names for a bar, a dive bar called the Bloated Goat. If you're into dive bars, I highly recommend it. It also has this wonderful chocolate shop called Sweet Sensations. And it's, uh, it, well, there we have the Bloated Goat. And this was a candy shop in the 40s, and they, somebody bought it, renovated it, and they still have wonderful homemade chocolates. So again, if you're, as I said, if you want to take Grand River, start in Brighton and go all the way to Lansing. Here are some great and delicious stops along the way. Another favorite of ours was this wonderful place on, right as you go into Weberville called the Sinclair Grill. Somebody bought an old gas station from the 30s. Inside, it's small, but it has wonderful automobile memorabilia, old hubcats, old road signs. You could spend a lot of time just looking around in there. They have burgers and wonderful things. They also have Michigan State dairy ice cream in there. So it's a great summer spot along the way. Then there's Williamston, and Williamston hasn't changed a lot. And if you could see this picture a little better, you'd see that most of the buildings are still there that were there about 1910. There's a comparison, and they're mostly still yeah, there. Yeah, there's a comparison. This is now a night photo. We're going to have to start <laughs> stop saying, if you could see the picture. Yeah, if you could see but it But here's now. an interesting story. Speaking of old theaters, the Sun Theater, which was built in 1947, um, you know, a lot of little theaters, unfortunately, have had to close because you have to switch over to digital projectors. This is a recent thing. They were going to have to close. It's a family-owned theater. But the community so wanted to keep this theater that somebody started a Kickstarter GoFundMe campaign online. They raised $65,000 to get a new... It, it's amazing. And they were able to keep the theater by a digital projection, and they're still sewing... Um, movies. You can't see here, but it says cry room. They have this little, this is actually upstairs. There's a little room that you can still see the movie, but you could bring your crying baby. I think this is a great innovation, especially for people who use their cell phone <laughs> or talk. They should go up to the cry room, but they still have this room where moms could take their baby, let them cry, and still be able to watch the theater to the, to the movies. And then we end up in Lansing. Any Michigan State fans here go green, go white. Yay! Right. And we have a little parade of people when it was called the MAC, Michigan Agricultural College, going down here. And down on the bottom, I don't know if a lot of you have been driven by this thing that looked like the spaceship have landed. This is uh, the new art museum, well, relatively new, the Broad Art Museum. Very modern art, but worth going into just to see the building. And some of our other favorite sites, and Old Town East Lansing has really renovated and has so many interesting stops and we wanted to tell you about a few. I highly recommend the number one stop to me in East Lansing is this place called Prusa's Pets. It's a pet store but it, it is literally like going to a fabulous aquarium. It has hundreds of fish tanks, believe it or not, and coral and exotic creatures, lizards, it has birds. It is really like they should charge admission but I'm glad yeah. they don't. We always tell, John and I are doing a bus tour of Grand River soon, and that's one of our stops. Absolutely. So it's worth the drive if you like fish especially, but if you also like birds or anything else. It's in East, and all these are in Old Town, East Lansing. Elderly Instruments, which is a nationally and internationally famous place. All kinds of musicians, everyone from Vince Gill to Metallica buy their instruments from there in, in, uh, at Elderly Instruments. There's even a fish ladder where the, it helps the fish go into the Grand River to spawn. And, uh, and that's a mural that's in downtown. But the, we see now Grand River. Here's our first instance of Grand River Avenue meeting Grand River the River. Right. Now, once you leave Lansing, Grand River ceases to be called Grand River, the road. It goes by a many different names, but usually it just goes by U.S. 16. Now, it, really, it actually is U.S. 16 from the point where it starts at the Detroit Athletic Club, but we don't really call it that much. But once we get to east, uh, west of Lansing, uh, we get into a lot of rural uh, areas, some interesting towns. Uh, you can see this great painted silo that says New Era Potato Chips that's still there. In fact, we took the picture. <laughs> and we got into Eagle. And Eagle is a pretty much forgotten little town. It used to be one of the railroad stops, uh, not only for the inner urban, but for a major railway as well. And this great postcard that, uh, that featured a young man behind the counter here, uh, it says, this is a picture of the store where I work and myself from Floyd. <laughs> and that was postmarked 1909. 
When we got there, we did find where that store was, and it's still a store today. It's called Swampers, um, and uh, we assume that's where Floyd worked. Now, here's Portland, Michigan, another town we highly recommend that nobody seems to know that's there. It's a beautiful town with wrought iron bridge, and the Grand River crosses there, too. There's a statue you can see over to the right of a man named Verlin Kruger. Um, he started canoeing when he was in his 40s. He canoed over 100,000 miles. He's in the Guinness Book of World Records. And he's from Portland, and there's a big statue of him. And it makes you just want to go right in the river there. It's a beautiful town right near Lansing. And then we get into Grand Rapids, one of the bigger cities along there. And also a little bit of a, of a, little bit of a Gordian knot if you're trying to follow Route 16, uh, US 16, because it changes much like US 12 does when you get into Indiana and Chicago. U.S. 16 changes roads quite a bit in downtown Grand Rapids. It's never called uh, Grand River, but it is uh, known by many different names. And if you go to the next one, it starts on Fulton Avenue, which goes past some wonderful towns, this wonderful bakery. Highly recommend Van's Pastry. Right. And that goes in past uh, the, the cottage, a wonderful restaurant. And then it turns into Division, and then Monroe, and Leonard. Here's an old bowling alley that John and I went to. We put it in there because it had lanes upstairs and it had these old, there used to be pin setters there. It's one of those things right out of a time warp. And when John called up to find out how old it was, he, he said, do you know how old uh, it is? He said to the kid behind the counter, he says, yeah, it's really old. So <laughs> that was not a lot of help, but it, it's a fascinating little place. Weird. Lots of places to go in Grand River. It's become a very big beer town. Just beyond that, once you're out of Grand Rapids, you get into Walker Station, which is what you might call a wide spot in the road. But you see by this uh, rather interesting building on the upper left, that is a telltale sign of a radio tower for the inner urban. And that would be the inner urban that serviced the west side of the state. Most of Walker Station was destroyed. And I don't mean the station there, but I mean the town of Walker Station was destroyed by a tornado in the 1950s. This is an old laundromat now that uh, has been uh, converted from an old railway station. It's the, the town of Berlin. What, in, during World War II, obviously, they didn't want to be called Berlin, so they changed their name to Marne. They still have the fair called the Berlin Fair, but it actually the town was changed to Marne. And one of the things we love, first of all, you can't make names like this up. This uh, guy's name was Eldred Garter, and his mother's name was Fern Garter, and they ran the switchboard. So back then, if you lived in Marne during the 40s, for example, or that's actually the 30s, if you needed to make a call, you had to go through either Eldred or his mom. They were the only two switchboard <laughs> operators, and if they weren't around, you couldn't make a call. He would sleep while his mom would be on the switchboard, and then she would sleep while he was on the switchboard. It was a real family sort of thing. They'd We'd sleep on the couch. So yeah, in case right somebody called. Talk about Hooterville, right? <laughs> and here's another wonderful town up on the west side of the state, Coopersville. It's a very big train town. They have their own little train line you can take there. Coopersville, and they have a train museum, too. It's a really fascinating town. Also famous for their native son, Del Shannon. If anybody remembers Del Shannon, run away, run, 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 run away. Number one hit, 1961. Del Shannon was from there. He's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And they have a car show every year in, in Del Shannon's memory. But again, that's a great town in the summer to go online and reserve a railway. You can take it through part of the town there. And take it to Marn, actually, yeah. Now, this is an interesting place because when you get to Nunica. Which sounds like something Sonny Elliott would have said, Nunica. Yeah, there's a little bit of a place called Nunica. Uh, at Nunica in 1941, U.S. 16, or Grand River, was rerouted. It no longer would go to Grand Haven, and instead would go to Muskegon. And this was a great boon for any of those little roads that were along the way from Nunica to uh, Muskegon. And uh, one of those places was Fruitport, which was actually kind of a, an up-and-coming industrial center in the, at the turn of the century and beyond. Now, if you went to Fruitport today, none of these items would be there. There was, there was a uh, ballroom, and there was an ironworks, and there was this wonderful place for the boats to dock. It's, it's pretty much a gas station and a, and a party store now. But when you get into Muskegon, 
uh, it's still quite a thriving city and there's a lot of interesting historical sites to see. Uh, one of those would be the USS Silversides, a World War II submarine. You can tour uh, the landing strip tank, which is an LST that would actually landed troops at Omaha Beach on D-Day. And uh, if you go forward, uh, it is also the home of the Buster Keaton Film Festival because uh, actually Muskegon was Buster Keaton's favorite home away from home. He grew up there in the summers because his father had an actor's uh, society that would spend their summers near Muskegon. You can see a, a, there's a statue of him, a bronze statue of him looking through a camera thing. And the, there's a center where he appears. And this is where you would come to the end of the line unless you got your car on the car ferry and took it across Lake Michigan. To continue along um, to Yellowstone, along Route 60, well, it's the, our version of a Route 66. US 16. You can see here, most direct to, you'd go through the Wisconsin Dells, the Badland, the Black Hills, the Bighorns, and finally you get to Yellowstone. So it's a great thing if you can look up there and see where it goes and where it would take you, that you can continue all the way, start at the Detroit Athletic Club and go all the way across the country and end up in Yellowstone. Wouldn't that be a fun route to take? Who needs Route 66 when you have Grand River, right? Actually, this one's still intact. I think most of Route 66 is gone. So, so you can still do this. <laughs> we haven't done it either, but that's all right. <laughs> so there's our road journey, and we're glad you took it with us, and we hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for being patient.